Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Jeremy Goodwin. Tan France is best known for his role as fashion expert on the hit Netflix series Queer Eye, where he and the rest of the Fab Five transform people's lives with inspiring lifestyle makeovers. Now France has a memoir out, officially released today. It's called Naturally Tan. He'll be in St. Louis this weekend to talk about it at St. Louis County Library headquarters. St. Louis Public Radio digital reporter Kay Petron spoke with France yesterday ahead of the sold-out event and started by asking him what he hopes readers take away from his story. Well, the reason why I wanted to write this book is that um, I wanted people who uh, have not felt very represented, overly represented, um, to to really feel like they're not alone. And for people who may have had um, any preconceived ideas or notions of what uh, my people are and what they represent uh, might get a better understanding of, of um, the diversity of my community. And and you talk a lot about the sort of dynamic of, you know, going on television and representing a community and hearing from people that, uh, you know, I've never seen someone like myself on television before. Um, what's that been like? It's been wonderful. Let me say, let me say this. It's not that I... Um, that I feel like I represent a community. I feel like I have a responsibility because I'm one of a few from my uh, community uh, that is that has a platform uh, that that I have. And so I feel a responsibility to make sure that I, I behave in a certain way, that I act in a certain way that is representative of a community and a positive representation. Um, there are many, many facets of our community, my community. Um, I represent one of those. Um, and it feels really powerful to uh, to be in mainstream media and uh, to lend my voice to um, to encourage people to see my people uh, as very very diverse. Got it. And and so you're known for your role as fashion expert on Queer Eye, but before then you were a, just a kid who loved clothes. You know, growing up in a mostly white town in the United Kingdom. What was that like? Um, it's weird being in a position now where I I get to um, uh, profess my love of fashion um, and, and the importance of it uh, because as a kid that was definitely discouraged. Um, I, I come from a community where individuality is definitely not um, appreciated or encouraged and so now to be doing that for a living and encourage, encouraging people to um, to showcase their individual style and their character through what they wear feels incredible. I, I've always seen fashion and style as very powerful. It can truly affect the way you view yourself and how people view you. Um, and so to be in a position where I can speak to that on a on a global platform feels incredible. I thought it was really interesting how you talked about you first sort of discovered that love of clothes while working in your grandfather's denim factory. Yeah. Um, so I want to make uh, make it clear, and I, apparently I didn't uh, with the book. I wasn't actually working as an employee with my granddad. That would have been illegal. I started when I was seven or eight. I figured um, that. Yeah. <laughs> I just loved it so much that my siblings couldn't care less about going to the factory. I was just obsessed with it. I I didn't think uh, I understood the importance of clothing until I got to see how they were constructed. Um, and so for me, it was it was my favorite playground. I got to experiment. I got to explore. I got to see just how something was made uh, and truly see value in clothes. Um, and so for me, it was the best experience. If I had an opportunity to do it again, I absolutely would. Uh, and that was my first experience in production. And it was something that I didn't really think was possible for a career for me. Um, I, I didn't know if that was ever going to be something that a South Asian boy was allowed to dream of. Um, but as I got older, it was the only option for me. And I know that you sort of lived a lot of the, your early fashion life in secret. Uh, you wrote about secret trips you took to New York as a teen yeah. and going to fashion school without telling your family. W- was that hard? Yeah, it w- I mean, it was, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, but it was hard um, because I didn't know how it was going to be received by my family or my community. The, the encouragement in, uh, in my community is always be a doctor, lawyer, or at the very worst, an engineer. Um, and they were your only options if you were to have a successful life, a happy life in the community. Um, and so it was hard to deviate and go for something that was something I was just passionate about. Passion isn't something that's encouraged uh, in my community. And so for me, it was it was difficult knowing that this could be um, really badly received by not only my family, but my community. However, 
very soon after I graduated, I I was able to show my family just what I could achieve and that it could be a viable career option for me. Um, and thankfully, I've continued to go from strength to strength in this industry um, and, and to get me to the point that I'm at now. So I'm hoping that that encourages uh, people in my community to see creative jobs as jobs that can truly uh, be successful. And in in your memoir, you talk a lot about sort of living and moving between these spaces as a as a South Asian in a white community and um, being gay and loving fashion in a religious family, um, moving between the United States, the United Kingdom. Uh, how did navigating so many different cultures sort of change your perspectives? Honestly, it gave me a really um, diverse perspective on uh, different communities. I was a version of myself in my own community. I was a different version of myself uh, in the Caucasian community. I then moved to the U.S. and I found a new community. I, I, I like to believe that all those experiences have made me uh, a much more rounded person. And uh, and so navigating my way through uh, each of these communities doesn't feel difficult anymore. I feel like I can fit in in most spaces. Uh, so for me, it's, it, for me, it, it was nothing but teaching moments for me. And um, so one of the big themes in your book is that so many of the good things in your life have come out of you sort of making those decisions to go be in the spaces that you want to be and be your authentic self. Do you have any advice for people who might be struggling to make that leap? Yes. My advice is this. Uh, If you truly feel a passion for something, make sure that you give everything you've got to it. You don't want to. This is going to be playful, but it's true. I, I've always thought this. If I'm going to deviate from the path that's set out by my family, I better make sure I excel at it. So therefore, I'm no longer the, the punchline or I'm not a punchline um, for everybody else that may fail in my family. Uh, I wanted to make sure that no matter what I did, I succeeded so that people can see uh, that you can deviate from the, the path. And so if you are going to if you are going to try something new, just make sure you give it your all to make sure that you succeed at it or do all you can to succeed at it um, because you don't want to be that one person that didn't follow uh, the grain and and you didn't try hard enough um, and therefore you've ruined the chance for everybody else in your community who might want to also try something different. And and so all of that has sort of brought you now to Queer Eye, but it sounds like you didn't really expect to get cast, you write in your book. You sort of mostly just went wanting to make friends. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. I I never in a million years dreamt that they would give me the job. And I think that that's why I got the job. I I was able to just be myself because I went to the audition to make friends. Um, And don't get me wrong, if I was going to get the job, I'd be really happy about it. But I was nervous thinking, um, uh, or not nervous, apprehensive thinking there's no way they're going to give somebody like me a job on uh, such a commercial show. Uh, So it actually put me in a great position to get the job. I was able to be myself. I was able to just be there purely for social benefit. And instead, that that put me in a position to be the most authentic and actually land the job. Are there one or two episodes of Queer Eye that have really stood out to you as examples of why you enjoy working on the show? Yes. uh, Neil Reddy's episode, episode two of season one. Um, I was with an Indian man. Um, it's the first time I've ever seen an Indian man and Pakistani man supporting each other um, and and working towards a common positive goal on a show. Um, so that felt really impactful for me. And then um, actually, actually every episode since then has uh, reminded me of why I'm, I'm so happy I do this job. I get to be very open and visible and uh, and encourage pe- encouraging people to see the LGBTQ community is very diverse, a lot more diverse than I've seen on TV before. It seems like there was a bit of a, a learning curve for you coming into the show and and not having that experience and sort of not knowing how to yeah. interact. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. When I first got the job and I started working on the show, uh, I was intimidated every day. I cried in the restroom most days um, because it's a very intimidating experience to go from never being on camera before from somebody who didn't even like having their photos taken to then being on a TV show where there's a full set and people waiting for you to perform. Uh, it was super intimidating. Um, and I don't think I ever would have uh, felt comfortable until I, I had the moment that I had where I was wanting to quit the show and the executive producer just talked me through what was going right and what was potentially going wrong for me. Um, I think I needed to be uh, I needed to be fearful of my job to 
decision and ask the questions of, of how I'm doing and how I could do better. And at that point, things changed for me. Um, and so, so yeah, at that, at that point, I was so scared. I didn't know if this was a job for me. I didn't think I was ever going to feel comfortable in front of a camera. Cut to now, uh, it's been a year and a couple of months, and now I'm, I'm not intimidated by the cameras at all. I, I just actually finished a live um, TV segment. I'm not phased by it at all, thank gosh. If you had told me a year and a half ago that I would be in this position now, I would have thought you were crazy. What's it been like going from sort of relatively unrecognizable to a, a public figure? Um, I went from completely unrecognizable, um, and uh, and so that's very strange. I still pinch myself. Um, uh, my husband and I were uh, sat uh, at dinner yesterday. Actually, we walked to dinner, and uh, and uh, he he actually mentioned we walked out the hotel. We strolled for about twenty seconds before somebody got very excited, and he said, "Oh my gosh, I, I forgot. Just for a moment, I forgot um, what you do for, that, that you are." public um, and I do regularly I know that sounds uh, like film modesty it, it really isn't I often it's not something you, you think of all day thinking oh I'm I'm relatively well known I I forget when I'm in my hotel room uh, and then I walk out onto the street thinking oh, I'm just going to quickly hail that cab and then you're reminded with very very uh, soon after you you step out into the street oh yeah people people feel like they know me they feel like they know me very intimately so I know that uh, you wrote as a kid you wanted to become a Bollywood star. Now that you're yeah. sort of used to the cameras, do you think you'd ever consider revisiting that dream? Yes. It's my dream still. Do I think it's ever going to happen? No. Would it <laughs> happen? Heck yes. And I don't need to be like the lead. I just want to walk on part. Like if somebody, uh, there's one big director in particular, if he said, hey, Tan, will you just stand in the background and serve tea? Yes. My answer is yes. And I will do it for free. Got it. Um, so you're coming to St. Louis later this week. Uh, is this your first trip to St. Louis? Or have you been before? Yeah, I've never been. No, I'm really excited about it. I've never been before. Uh, this is a weird comment to make. But I think Alan said she's from there. And I'm almost positive she said she's from there. Oh, she's talked about it a few times about how amazing it is. So I'm quite looking forward to seeing it. Are there any particular spots you're hoping to check out? I, okay, I'm not that well versed uh, <laughs> what there is to do in uh, St. Louis. No, I, I would lying if, I'd be lying if I said yes. Um, but every city I go to, I'm always excited to go because it's somewhere new. Um, I, I can't wait to see what the culture is in that city. That was Tan France of the Netflix show Queer Eye, talking with St. Louis Public Radio digital reporter Kay Petrin. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, saluting Earth Day on April 22nd with an ongoing commitment to help offset carbon emissions with sustainable harvesting of Missouri forests. Details at ChooseWood.com.